I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Glory be to God who allowed us to see this morning to be gathered together here yet again another Sunday to worship Him and to praise His name. Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Glory be to God. Amen. Glory be to God. Today, this Sunday, is the third Sunday of the season that we started, the season of flower, right? The season of flower. This season we celebrate of the fleeing of our mother, the Holy Virgin Mary, with her beloved child Christ into the desert when Herod wanted to persecute all the children this season is where the season we celebrate and commemorate, remember of her fleeing, being a refugee, did not have any food or a house into the desert of Egypt. This is the season that we celebrate and commemorate that. And it's titled, Zamanaz Egi, the season of flower. It's fascinating. It's very fascinating how our fathers, our forefathers, how they are so deep in wisdom, in understanding, how they align things together so that we would deeply understand of the salvation, our being saved, the love of God, and everything. Our title today for today's gospel is, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. What is the gospel that we read today? The Gospel of who? The Gospel of Matthew. Great job. The Gospel of Matthew. Chapter what? Chapter? Chapter 12. Chapter 12. Don't forget, I want you to go home and to read it. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. And the, as usually how the Gospels are written, as you know, there wasn't numbered. There was no chapter. It was a whole story. But our forefathers, they kind of classified it into chapters so that we would have a grasp, understanding of one idea to the next. So the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, when it starts, it starts saying, after that. You can't start any essay or any story saying after that. After what? Right? But it's, it, when you see like this, you have to go back and as we always do, have the context, the understanding of the past chapter, and connect that. In the past chapter, the, la the latter portion of the chapter, it starts with how Christ went to the cities. The, CC, the city called Capernaum. The city called Bethsaida. Right? And uh, the city called Korazi. He would go into those cities. But when he go to those cities, he was sad. He was, uh, he was heartbroken. He was discouraged. Why? Because he started preaching in different cities. When he come to those cities, they, you know, shunned him. They didn't accept him. They didn't listen to his words. And he said, Woe to you, Korazi. Woe to you, Capernaum. Everything that I have done into this city, all the miracles... If it has been done into other cities, even to the point if it has been done into Sodom and Gomorrah, they would tear their clothes. They would put ashes on themselves and they would repent. What more can I do for you? So he was so heartbroken. And then he left. It's after that Matthew chapter 12 starts. And in the first story after he says after then what did christ do have you guys who are listening to this, the 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 gospel what did christ do chapter 12 verse 1 there's something that christ did how did it, how did the chapter start what what action did he do he went into where into the grain field he went into the grain field let me ask you a question. On what day did he went to the grain field? On Sabbath. I don't know about you, but me, like I try to connect dots. I, I just don't read it. And 
I, maybe I'm like a doubtful person, I don't know, but I want to ask things, why? Why? If you read in, in the gospel, multiple places, there are two things that are repeatedly happening. One is the explanation, the metaphor, the parable of grains, fruits, vine, plants, right? There's a lot of it. Christ said in John chapter 15, I am the vine and you're the branches, you bear fruit. And he said there was a person who planted a vineyard and expected fruit. There was a lot of places that he mentioned about fruit, grains. And there is a lot of places intentionally that he went to do something on the Sabbath. Sometimes I feel like in the story, Christ would sit down in his house or everything like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday and wait for the Sabbath and go out intentionally to do things. If he's traveling, why he go into the grain fields? Is a grain field like a path? No. Why? Because every step that our Lord does is with a purpose. Every step. When they were following in the story of the Samaritan woman, he said, you go. I have to go to on this well to sit down with a purpose. When people, multitude gathered with him and asked him, when he go, think about this story, when he go on the path, he intentionally go towards this tall tree and see upward, say, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come, come into your house. Every step that he take is with a purpose. He went to the grain field. Grain field is not a road to go, but he had a purpose. He wanted to break the hardened hearts of the Pharisees. He's the Lord. He's God. He knows that his disciples are hungry. He went to the grain field on a Sabbath day. And here enough, they pluck the trees and they start eating because they're hungry. And the accusers got up. They followed him. He said, look, and we'll explain the story and we'll break it down. He'll say, look, your disciples are doing what it's not supposed to do. Look, look. And he gave them a story. He said, don't you know in the Old Testament when David was hungry, when people are following him, the, the enemies, he didn't have, have nowhere to go, he didn't have food. So he went into the temple. And he took on the show bread, the sacrifice bread that no one shouldn't take except the priest. But he ate. But was that a blasphemy? Was that a blasphemy? Was he cursed for that? No. Because the Heavenly Father sees the heart, the intention. And he told him, don't you know, on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath day, which for others is told like, don't do anything, don't you know the priests would go inside and, you know, put an offering and cut the animals and put an offering which they shouldn't do on Sabbath. But it's not a blasphemy for them. See, God is not absolute as we think. God understands. Depends on your intention he sees. Now, they accused him. Then he said, if you would have known, if you would have known what the prophecy said, what is the title of our sermon? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hosea, the prophet, is the one who said this. If you go in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, he's the one who said it because he was prophesying, telling the, the, the Israelites at that time, whatever that you're doing, whatever the outward thing that you're doing, you're fast. You're giving your your all rituals. It means nothing for me. It means nothing for me if it's not from your heart. I desire mercy, but not sacrifice. So Christ bring that idea. 
He told them, if you would have known, if you would have known what it means, you wouldn't have accused my disciples. That wasn't enough for him. On a Sabbath day, intentionally who went to the grain field, after that he went, where, where did he went? Into the synagogue. Knowing that there would be a person there, knowing that he would heal him. And they plotted against him. He, wait, 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 he's coming. Okay, we're going we're gonna to find him now. We're going to find him. If he does something, we're going to accuse him. And without even him doing anything, they asked him, teacher, they're not even saying teacher from their hearts. Is it lawful to heal someone who's sick? He gave him an example of, if you guys have a sheep, and let's say if he strays away from the barn, even on the Sabbath day, would you say like, oh, it's Sabbath and sit? You wouldn't do that. And this flock is my children, my sheep. I will save them. And he saved them. Now, let's go to the good stuff. The deep message of this. And it's fascinating. Our forefathers, they aligned the flower, the season of flower, with this story. Why? Because, one, what did the apostles were doing? Making, like getting grains, right? Grains and eating, which is from a plant. Now, when they were eating, the Pharisees are the accusers. And in, even in the later chapter of that, about the person, they said they plotted again so that they would accuse him. Now here, be with me here. Who's in the Bible is depicted as an accuser? Who, who depicted? Who was written? I can tell you. It's in the Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 12, verse 10. He said, then, John, St. John, the theo theologian, he's the one who said, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his, his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brothers who accused them before our God day and night have been cast down. Brothers and sisters, accusing is the work of the devil. Peter are called in the Bible Satan. Satan. Even though he was, you know, he's human and everything. So if you guys are inclined and in that itching to, to accuse someone, know that you're acting as Satan. An accuser does not care about anyone but self-righteousness. An accuser does not care about anyone. Most of us here share this, right? See that? Oh, especially on our social media, right? So-and-so, look at his hair. So-and-so, the girl, look at her stand here. Accusers. Satan. Nothing of them is uh, except self-righteousness. Thinking that they're protecting the church. Satan. An accuser looks outward. An accuser looks outward. Let's go a little bit deeper of this. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 22, Therefore, if you died with Christ for the, from the basic principles of this world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not test, do not handle, which all concern things which perish. St. Paul talks about, not even St. Paul, later on John Chrysostom talked about it. I didn't bring it here, but if you research, you'll find it. He said, Lord seeks of mercy. He expects mercy. 
He expects understanding. He expects patience. Not the perishable things that outwardly that we see. Our title, I desire mercy and not a sacrifice. Let's break that down. That's actually the, the core message that I'm trying to explain today. I desire mercy and sacrifice. There is two aspects in this, in this phrase. There is mercy and there is a sacrifice. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, some begs, this begs the question, what does that mean? Does that mean that God does not look, does not seek or does not honor sacrifice? Is that what it means? When he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, is that what it means? If you think like that, maybe you didn't read the Bible well. From the beginning of the Genesis story, Noah, later on the Israelites, Every time you see uh, Elijah, sacrifice being done in the Old Testament. But not only in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well. We see the sacrifice being given in Romans chapter 12. It says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. So, it's not a question of God does not please, would not be pleased of our sacrifices. It's not that. It has different meaning. So we'll connect mercy and sacrifice because it's a season of flower with flower and the fruits. Mercy, sacrifice, flower and fruits. Let me ask you a question. Is there any plant in the entire world, in the entire world, you can do research on this, is there any plant which produces fruit without a flower? Is there any plant? You can, you can search anything. You can say grains. You can say grass. There is no plant that doesn't go with the flowering stage without going to the flowering stage, to produce fruits. None of it. When a plant has a flower, it indicates the possibility of seed or fruit production. When, a, when there is a flower, it indicates the possibility of seed or fruit production. If the, if the flower is successfully pollinated, the fertilized ovules will develop into seeds. That's why Christ on the fig tree, when he saw the flower, what did he do? He went there. Because if there is a flower, there has to be a fruit. When there is a flower, there is a fruit. And when Christ talked about the, the, pro, the prophecy, mercy, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, in this context, mercy is flower. Sacrifice is a fruit. Are you following me here? Are you listening to me here? Mercy is flower. Sacrifice is fruit. When I say mercy, I'm not only saying mercy. What I'm saying is the spiritual virtues of the soul. Forgiveness, patience, peacefulness, understanding, endurance, the fruits of the Spirit. That's why in the Galatians, if you remember, you read, what did he say? The fruits. What did he use the word fruits? The fruits of the Spirit. All those, mercy, that is the flower in this context. And sacrifice is your fruit. The grain, the wheat that comes out of it is our sacrifice. So flower is, is still an essential precursor to fruit production. You cannot have a fruit without a flower. You, that's inseparable. So I desire mercy, not sacrifice means there is something that needs to be done first before the sacrifice. So from the spiritual 
virtues of the soul, what we talked about, including mercy, we see three things, only three things. And how those produces a fruit, and I'll give you examples for all of them. The first one. The first one is faith. The first one is faith, Amnet, having faith. We need, we ought to have the flower of faith so that we produce the fruit. What kind of fruit we're we producing? To produce a fruit of sacrifice, because we say the mercy and sacrifice, right? To produce a fruit of sacrifice, sacrificing what is dear to us. Sacrificing what is dear to us. Example. The prime example. I'll give you from all eras. The pioneer, the father of faith, Abraham. Abraham. Abraham is a great example. He has the spiritual soul virtue as kind of mercy, which is his complete faith in God. If someone asks you, all right, leave your job, leave your family, and follow me in Far East Asia, and I'll make you rich. I'll make you rich. You didn't see any sign. You didn't see the outcome of things. But you would say, I trust me, trust me. Would you do it? Abraham, did he see his seeds as the stars? He didn't see? He didn't even see that. He didn't even see that. He didn't get a chance to see that. He only saw who? His son. That's it. But God promised him, no, I'll make your seed, I'll make your seed, your generation like the sand and the stars. He trusted him. Trusted him so much so, having that faith of flower, he was ready to sacrifice what is dear to him. What is dear to him? What was dear to Abraham? His son. And God asked him, bring your son and sacrifice him for me. What did he say? Yes, sir. No question asked. No doubt. Grab his son, the, the, the woods, the fire. He went to sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, are you ready to sacrifice what is dear to you? You know, like you don't understand because it's like we've been growing up together since we were young. We're, we're friends for life, even though they're leading me to unrighteousness. But yeah, you know, how can I let go of them? Who are, they are, those are dear to me. You're not given a sacrifice. You may, have a, you may have a flower because you came to church. You said, I want to follow Christ. But as if you have a flower, it's certain you have to have a fruit, a sacrifice. You know, I can come to church, I can do everything, but I can't, I can't let go of that toxic relationship. I can do everything, but like this job is my only trust that I have. As if God does not give us another job. What is dear to you? Ask your soul, ask yourself, what is dear to you? Are you willing to give that up? Are you willing to sacrifice that? That's the first example. The second example that we see, the first is faith. Whoever has faith, he's willing to sacrifice what is dear to him. Whoever has flower will bring fruit. I desire mercy, not a sacrifice. What does he mean? Before giving me a sacrifice, have mercy, have, the, have faith, have the, the virtues of the soul. Secondly, Obedience. Obedience. 
And the greatest example of all of human creation is our mother, the Holy Virgin Mary. And it's so befitting that we celebrate her in this season because none other man did a sacrifice as her. Obediently, the angel showed up to her. You'll bear a child. Let your will be done to me. I am the maidservant. See, obedience. She's obedient enough to live everything, not even to, her, to, to, be, to hold and be a dwelling place of the Son of God. Not only that, after that is born, what is the season we talked about this today? Fleeing into Egypt without having any food, anywhere to go, with fear of someone coming to kill them. Think about it. We hear a lot of refugees right now, the, you know, torn, war-torn, you know, areas, right? She partook of that. So what's the flower? The flower is obedience. But what is the fruit? The fruit is losing your comfort. The fruit is losing your comfort. Our mother, the Holy Virgin Mary, did that. Leaving her comfort to go from desert to desert. I desire mercy but not sacrifice. In order so that you would leave your comfort, you ought to be able to have obedience to God. Obedience to God. I was telling somebody yesterday that uh, recently someone came to our house. And then uh, they're a beloved, you know, guest. We used to be close and everything. So they stayed in our house. And we didn't have extra bed. So we agreed to let them to sleep in our bed. And I volunteered willingly to go and to sleep on the floor. It's been so long for me to sleep on the floor. It was the most uncomfortable thing. The most uncomfortable thing. How many of us are willing to lose our comfort and be obedient to lose our comfort? Or is our Christianity is a bubble with our comfort? Ask yourself. Whatever discomfort that comes to, as soon as it comes, are you, no. As if Christ promised that if you follow me, there is always comfort. That's not the gospel. There is no teaching like that. If you follow me, you'll suffer. But at the same time, just by suffering, worldly suffering, is not without foundation. It's not, it doesn't have a foundation unless we're obedient to take the suffering. Because sometimes we say like, oh, I'm suffering, but we don't have obedience to God, obedience to God. The best example is our mother, the Holy Virgin Mary. She's obedient and she takes all the suffering until the crucifixion of Christ. Lastly, in the, I, told, I gave you an example from Old Testament and then the New Testament. I'll give you an example in the, second, the, the generation after the New Testament. One of my favorite saints in the church. His name is Ignatius. Saint Ignatius of Antioch. He was a bishop. And our, some forefathers say that he's a child, how Christ, you know, hold him to teach, saying like, unless you become a child, you could not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some say that that child was the great Saint uh, Ignatius. Ignatius, in our church, we saw Metola Ambesa, which means who was thrown for the lions. He was, the, he was being sacrificed. What is his flower? His flower was boldness. His flower was boldness. What is his sacrifice? Giving up his life. When people, his disciples say, oh, let's take you, let's, let's hide you and take you out from Rome. No. 
you know, the, the, the words that he said? And this is a very well-known words he said. I am the wheat of God. Let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I may be found a pure bread of Christ. You know how lovely that is? How, how, how deep that is? So he knew, he understood, because he lived with the, the apostles. He understood that his sacrifice is the fruit. So he said, let me be wheat, wheat like a fruit or a grain fruit, right? Let me be wheat of God. Let me be grounded. Are you willing first by faith to give up what is dear to you? Second, are you willing to give up comfort because of your obedience? Thirdly, are you willing to be bold enough to sacrifice your life? I'm not saying giving up your life to die, but your status, your status with your friendship, your status with your work, with on your school. If someone asks you, you're praying. If someone sees you, you're praying. Oh, I shouldn't be seen praying. What if my friends say, if they see me reading the Bible? Sacrifice your life, your ego. Sacrifice your status. I desire mercy, but not sacrifice. I'm concluding. Does anybody know the Hebrew word of sacrifice? Does anybody know? Julio, what is it? Kurban. Kurban. Sacrifice. Kurban. What do we do here today? What is presented for here today? What we call it Qurban is a sacrifice on behalf of us. But not only Qurban. You know the, the deeper word, what I really like actually I was searching, the, the root word of Qurban, it says Karav. Qurav or Karav. You know what it means? It means brought near to God. Brought, bringing near to God. The Qurban is what bringing near, near us to God. Not only that, our sacrifice is what brings near us to God. Mercy that does not mature into sacrifice is incomplete. Mercy that does not much mature into sacrifice is incomplete. As same way, the flower without a fruit is beauty without purpose. Flower without a fruit is beauty without purpose. The flower of mercy, what we talked about, shows promise. But without the fruit of sacrifice, it remains only potential. So having the spiritual virtues, the faith, I have faith, it's a great potential. You know, I, I can forgive, I can love, it's a great potential. But it needs to be fruitful by sacrifice. The flower of mercy shows promise with the potential. Never transforming into something that nourishes or sustains others. Likewise, now we're talking about flower without a fruit, right? Same way, fruit or sacrifice without a flower misses the foundation. Misses the foundation. It doesn't have a foundation. So our brothers and sisters, especially in our, in our society, in our, in our um, community, Doing all the works, the fast, the, do, the prostration and everything, all of those things that we do without the foundation of mercy, without the foundation of understanding our brothers and sisters, without understanding and praying for them instead of accusing them. You don't have a foundation. Just as a plant cannot bear a fruit without a fruit, Without first flowering, our sacrifices are meaningless unless they are rooted in mercy, compassion, and love. This is the deeper teachings of when Christ says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, because they focused on sacrifice. He didn't say that sacrifice is not needed at all. But both go hand in hand with the foundation of Mercy, compassion, understanding, love, the fruits of the Spirit, we need to sacrifice. 
being through fasting, through prayer, and all of those things to feel discomfort, to leave us, sanctify ourselves from the worldly things. And at the end, also sacrifice of our ego, our feelings. That's what God desires. That's the deeper message of the season of flower. It's not only commemorating things, but return everything back to our life. We may have a flower, but we need to have a fruit. We may seemingly be bearing a fruit, but if we don't have a flower, it, you don't have a foundation. So may God give us the true understanding and wisdom to first have a foundation. And then not only sit and be stagnant on foundation, but produce a fruit, which means our sacrifice in our life. May God help us to achieve that. I pray that God make us this message resonate to each and every one of you and bear a fruit. Glory be to God. Oh.